Hey, my name is Allison Hill, and I'm an associate professor of pediatrics at OHSU. And I'm really excited to be with you all here today to talk about Big Magic with R, Creative Learning Beyond Fear. Um, and I want to make note that my slides are at this link here. I think Chester just posted it in the general channel um, on the Slack. So um, there's going to be a few slides where I have sort of a brain dump of a lot of information. And so um, I'm going to kind of transparent those out and send you to the link so that you have the resources that I'm talking about, but I'm not going to walk through them. So don't try to scribble things down um, if you're thinking that that was a lot of information and I didn't have time to write it down. It's all at the link. So why big magic? Um, I'm guessing that a lot of people here may have heard of the book Eat, Pray, Love. Maybe read the book, saw the movie, have strong opinions on the matter. Um, so don't walk out on me now, don't leave. Um, uh, a lot of people are less familiar with Elizabeth Gilbert's other book called uh, Big Magic, uh, Creative Living Beyond Fear. And I read this book a few years ago and I thought it was a really, really uh, kind of nice practical guide towards uh, having more creativity in your life. And so I enjoyed it for what it was at the time, but then more recently, I started rereading the book a couple months ago because it was still on my Kindle and one night I finished another book and I happened to see this one and I was like, oh, maybe I'll give this one another shot. And I had a totally different experience uh, on the second read. So when I was rereading it, I was teaching a new course in R and I had been talking a lot with students and uh, research team members of mine about how to learn new things in R and I realized as I was reading this book that the five ingredients that Elizabeth Gilbert says are critical for creative living are the same things that I think are critical for creatively learning R and creatively learning new things in R. So that was my inspiration today. Um, and who am I? Why do I know anything about learning R or teaching other people how to learn R? Um, I use R every day for my research. I'm a researcher at OHSU's Center for Spoken Language Understanding. And I uh, study health-related applications of natural language processing-based methods. I'm also completely self-taught. I have never taken a boot camp in R, a workshop on R. I've never finished a data camp course. Um, I have never taken a formal course that used R. Um, I did get a minor in quantitative methods when I got my PhD in psychology, and I actually took more classes in statistics than in psychology, but those were all taught in stats. So if you're familiar with that language, that doesn't necessarily translate easily to R. Um, but when I started at OHSU, I knew that I wanted to teach a statistics course in the computer science graduate education program there, and I knew that I needed to use R for that. I knew that it was something I needed to learn because I felt like it was the way of the future for both doing and teaching statistics. Um, so, in my opinion, this was a very dark time to learn R. It was like 2010, it was eight years ago. Um, this is actual picture of me trying to learn R in 2010. Um, there was like no online resources. All the books I could find were really crappy. They were all intended for people who knew computer science and were programmers. Um, and I just found it a really lonely experience. So this is kind of one of the things that motivates me when I'm teaching. Um, I also didn't know about an integrated development environment like our studio. I actually was hacking through with the R console and it took me like eight months of learning R before somebody told me like, hey, you should check out this thing called R studio. And that was like totally life changing. So I think it's worth noting because there are things that we all sort of assume that everyone knows that everyone does not know. Um, and this was a, really a, a, a life changing experience for me to learn about an IDE. This was also pre-Tidyverse, so um, there were some of the beginning packages that are now part of the Tidyverse, but this was um, when there wasn't this sort of ecosystem of packages called the Tidyverse that has sort of a consistent syntax and format, and that can also be really helpful for beginners for learning how to work with their own data, because in the Tidyverse sort of ecosystem of packages, all of the functions have sort of a consistent syntax so that if you learn one function in one package, it's pretty easy to translate that knowledge to learning a new function in the same package and then going even beyond that to learn a new package with new functions as well that's still in the same Tidyverse ecosystem. So I think right now is a really great time to be learning R or to be learning new things in R because there's such a focus now in the R community on supporting learners and realizing that everyone who uses R is necessarily an R learner because you're constantly having to learn new things, right? There's always a new package that you want to use. There's always, you know, changes to a package that you feel familiar with and you have to figure out how to reuse some things. So we're all constantly kind of following this moving needle. Um, I've also had the opportunity to teach over 100 masters and PhD students at OHSU so far since I've been here. Um, and I've been really lucky because I was able to teach students who know formal programming languages in the computer science program. Um, but more recently, I've also been able to include a lot more students who have 
different backgrounds who don't come from knowing a programming language. So I've been able to see kind of both sides of the learning struggle, people who come into it and say like, oh my god, what kind of programming language is this? And then I've heard people saying like, well, what is a programming language and why would you make scripts to be able to create a plot? So I'm pretty familiar with all of the struggles that uh, students seem to encounter and I sort of maintain that the five ingredients I'm going to talk about today are critical for both new learners and for people who are more advanced users who are trying to learn and sometimes trying to teach other people on their team. So who are you? I'm assuming since you're all here, you're at least R curious. Um, you might be a R beginner or an advanced R user. You might use R every day, maybe every week. Um, but why are we all here? Um, I'm uh, guessing that we're all here to do one of two things or maybe both things at the same time. And that's to either do your job better or get a better job or maybe get a job in general. Um, and so that's usually where I come from when I'm teaching. Even though I know if you're a new, new user, you're thinking, gosh, these people seem really enthusiastic about a tool that they use for work and why is there this whole community around this? It's a little bit weird, especially um, me coming from using SAS. There certainly wasn't like any kind of conferences on using SAS and excitement about new things you could do in SAS, right? Um, but I think, uh, I think that's one of the best things about learning R is that it's, it has a little bit of a fun element to it and you can have fun with it in addition to actually doing your job. So what are the five ingredients that I'm going to say are essential for learning R or learning new things in R? Um, their courage, enchantment, permission, persistence, and trust. And these are the five ingredients that Elizabeth Gilbert claims are critical for creative living. I say they're critical for creative learning. So what is courage? Um, for me, courage is having a plan. Um, courage is sort of your first step, your first ingredient towards doing anything new. Um, but you have to be planful about it. So you have to set aside time. Um, whether or not you're signing up for a formal course or not, you have to make time take over some of the things that go on in life, jobs, kids, all of these things, and make time for learning. Setting yourself up a schedule, so having some kind of intent about how you're going to spend your time. Um, finding resources, this is often one of the biggest struggles that students find. Um, as I mentioned, when I learned R, there actually wasn't like this plethora of resources, but now there's almost so many that it's sort of a dizzying array of figuring out where to start sometimes. Um, and then sometimes you're going to have to pony up some money. So you might decide that the best learning path for you involves maybe an online course that you pay for or buying a new textbook. So all of these things are important to keep in mind as you're starting to learn. And you may or may not need to take a formal class with an instructor that's like a quarter long or a semester long. You may not need to do that. So all of this may sound sort of familiar if you've taken a college class somewhat recently in your memory. This is exactly what an instructor does for you when they make up a syllabus. Um, and you might remember a syllabus as the thing that you got on the first day of class and probably threw away or never read or maybe the instructor totally veered off track and never returned to the syllabus. Um, but I maintain that a syllabus is a really great tool for learning to be able to know the materials that you're expected to learn, to be able to see the sequence of things and to be able to figure out the scope, like how far you're going to get with this learning plan. And so the whole point of coming up with a plan is figuring out what you're going to focus on first and how you're going to get there. So I'm going to give you a few resources aimed more towards new users. Um, so if you have uh, not learned R yet but you're interested, I usually suggest starting with the tidyverse. So the ways to gather your tidy courage are um, R for Data Science and Modern Dive. These are two really great textbooks to start off with. Um, they both are available online completely for free, the full books. You can also order R for Data Science in print if you like that. Um, and this is a recommendation for both, not or. Um, I think these are really complementary. So the nice thing about Modern Dive is that it also includes some basic intro statistics. And R for Data Science has a little bit more breadth in terms of the number and range of packages that it goes over. So I typically encourage students and in my classes we kind of volley back and forth between these two resources. Um, you can also build up your courage interactively. Uh, by maybe paying money to take a course with DataCamp, for example. Um, DataCamp has an academic license, so I've been able to use this in my classes, and I've heard really great um, feedback from students for the introduction to the Tidyverse course by David Robinson. Um, my students really enjoyed this one recently. Um, and you can also use Swirl, which is learning R&R. &R. This is going to be completely free. Um, it's developed at Johns Hopkins, and there's a number of different add-on packages that come with it. And I've also used this in classes and had really good luck. Students really enjoyed using it. Um, if you are Tidyverse fluent already and are interested in sort of going deeper into base R or you just want to bypass the Tidyverse completely, um, I recommend these two books. They're both um, not available online for free. You have to buy them both from No Starch Press. Uh, the first is Art of R Programming. This one was really helpful um, 
to me, and I never actually have the print version of my own book because it's always on loan to a student, and I actually don't even know where my current version is right now, but I'm sure I gave it to a student a couple months ago, and they're pouring through it. Um, and then the Book of R is also another one that my students really provide good feedback on. It also has some introductory statistics. Um, the main problem with these two is that they won't give you any kind of tidy verse functionality. But those are all great places to start. Um, if you're an advanced user, uh, you might be familiar with figuring out how to learn a new package by using a couple of different tools. Um, this was an uh, interesting poll I saw on Twitter, and I obviously voted for the GitHub README. Um, but you can also look for installed vignettes, third-party blog posts. I think the problem with looking for third-party blog posts is that they're a little bit hard to discover. It's hard to know where to find those. But these are all great resources if you're trying to learn a new thing in R. Uh, and these are my suggestions for kind of all-purpose courage. So I typically go through the package reference docs, the package vignette, a GitHub README. This is going to be a slide that I'm going to give you the link for because I'm going to talk through it really fast. Um, is there an RStudio cheat sheet? Are there stat 545 materials by Jenny Bryan? Is there a roundup by Mara Averick? So all of these are names that if you don't know them, you'll come to know them because their resources are so good for learners. Um, and then more recently, there's a website called R Weekly that um, sort of aggregates all of the R tutorials their user contributed on GitHub. So uh, if you want that list of resources and you find it useful, go to the link, they're all in there. Um, so a basic uh, courageous plan, I think, is just writing some stuff down. So this is one of my friends, Charles Gray. She uh, just on Wednesday decided that she wanted to start a blog. So her goal was to start writing posts, goal of the day, and find Allison Hill's thingy about it. And that's kind of enough to have a plan. Like you've figured out some resource, you've figured out some goal. And that's really the main thing that I'm, I'm trying to get you all to think about is to be a little intentional about your learning. And the idea for most people, um, if you're a new user, for example, is trying to figure out how to go, how to tie these, two, these three things together. So going from ideas that are in your head to words that are part of the vocabulary of our users to then figuring out how to translate that into our code. So starting with some good materials and learning how to use them, like a package vignette or a really great textbook like Modern Dive, you're kind of taking your brain out of it for a little while, and you're just trying to learn these words and figure out how they translate into our code. And that's a really big deal because that helps you be able to talk to other people about your own R code, and that allows you to be able to read stuff about learning new R code. So I view this as a really important skill for people to be able to learn this new vocabulary and be able to figure out how it interacts with R code. And you can sort of let your brain relax a little bit and just focus on that and don't so much focus on trying to interpret your own ideas yet. So this is how it feels when you're kind of approaching learning and you have no plan. It's going to feel like there's just a lot of stuff out there and I don't know quite where to start. Um, but I think that if you're a courageous planner, you're going to be kind of a little bit more excited about your learning, right? Um, you're going to feel like, I know what I'm doing. I at least know how to get there. And this is when it's time for your second ingredient, uh, which is enchantment. Um, and I claim that enchantment is the joy of working with code that just works. Um, and I want to call this out because I think it's important to appreciate when you're there because it doesn't always work. Um, and I love seeing when new users start uh, figuring stuff out because they start posting on Twitter things like, every time I learn a new little thing in our stats, I feel like a wizard ninja for like two seconds, which is nice. And this is a really good feeling, and I think advanced R users have figured out ways to maximize feeling some enchantment throughout your day. You're kind of getting some basic code to work, um, and it feels really nice to do that. And I think new users sometimes uh, grasp onto this and maybe sometimes forget this feeling later on because you do enter sort of a pit of devastation at some point. Um, another uh, tweet that I really loved was, it's 9.30 and I have retrieved the allelic richness of my populations. I feel like a literal wizard. I'm sure in 45 minutes I will feel dumb again, but oh well. And that's probably what most people feel like when they're learning something new in R. So I think it's always important to remember that it's not magic though, it's code, right? There's a reason why it works. And your job when you're adding enchantment is that you're taking somebody else's code, maybe you're going through a well-resourced document like a package vignette or modern dive or R for data science, and your job is not to figure out whether their code works or not. I'm like 99% sure that code is going to work. Your problem is, your job is to figure out why it works, how it works. So I never suggest just sitting back and passively reading code, reading through a textbook online, reading through a package vignette. Um, I think that is not going to be effective for your learning. Um, and the problem is that really well done code presented in a nice way by skilled educators is going to look like it makes sense. And it rarely makes actual sense. 
Um, so the way to do it, I think, is to open up either an R script or an R markdown document locally on your computer and start working through examples and actually do them locally. Even if you're doing something like Data Camp, where it's an interactive console, I recommend that you always work in parallel on your desktop and make sure it works on your machine. And you, part of this is just getting used to the feeling of typing these commands, doing them fresh, and not just taking somebody else's word for it that it works, seeing it for yourself. What you should not do is copy-paste their code. Um, this is something that I see students do a lot, and this is going to fill in a lot of the blanks for you that you don't even realize are there. So some of the most common errors that I see are people maybe forgetting parentheses, commas. You don't know which named argument comes in quotes or not. Um, you'll have misspellings and variable names. You might um, forget how, whether something has like caps versus lowercase. So all of these things are really important to go ahead and type on your own. So it may feel totally redundant. You're looking at some perfectly straightforward code on your screen. But go ahead and type it into whatever document you want to use. And as you're doing that, for every single function, I want you to type question mark function name so that you can actually see the help documents. Because at this stage, to get over sort of that, uh, that mask of enchantment, feeling like you're all powerful without knowing how you're powerful, is to actually figure out why the function works. So being able to interpret these help documents and go through the description, usage, and arguments and figuring out why exactly those arguments look the way they do. Why does this function work the way I see it working? Um, so this is my biggest tip for at this stage in learning uh, anything new is to use your, your hash comments and use question mark and make sure that you teach yourself how to use those help docs. And I think even sometimes in formal courses, we sort of ignore being able to teach students how to do this. And it's a really big deal for being able to do independent problem solving later. So one of my favorite examples is uh, Katie Jolly, who I think was a graduate student at the time. She tweeted that when I use a new R function or learn a new thing for R stats, I write it down in one big Google Doc. It's not the most efficient method, but now I have 40 plus pages of helpful hints. Plus, just writing something down helps me remember it in the future. And then she used the hashtag DS Learnings, which stands for Data Science Learning. Um, and I think this is really great advice. My only suggestion would be not to do it in a Google Doc. <laughs> Maybe do it in our Markdown document or an R script so it's a little bit uh, easier to work with. And always remember that at this stage when you're learning new functions, that repetition is really powerful. Try repeating yourself over and over again. Get in the habit of typing code. And try seeing what, what breaks your code. Try making small changes and see what happens to the output. And the point at this uh, point in your learning is to start going backwards from our code to actual ideas in your head. So now you know how our code works and start making notes to yourself in whatever document you're using, using either your comments or in an R markdown document, you can use just markdown text outside of the R code chunks and make notes to yourself about what this R code does that translates to things that you'd likely want to do with your data. So think about your common workflows, things that you want to do for your actual job and realize how the R code maps onto those ideas rather than going the other way around. So one of the problems I often see students struggling with is that they have this idea for what they want to do, but not knowing how to express that in R makes it really hard for us to communicate about it. It's much easier to find all of a sudden, oh, the way to add a new column maybe is this dplyr function called mutate. You wouldn't have said at the beginning that you wanted to mutate your data frame to add a new column, but that's actually the function that you need to know. So figuring out how the R code maps onto your ideas is sort of a critical step at this point when you're going through this, uh, adding this enchantment ingredient. So this is how I feel like I see students feeling when they're adding enchantment. It's like a really exciting process because code is just working. You're figuring out some kind of basics about the help docs and you feel like R is making you feel all powerful. And when you've had just enough enchantment, you're gonna feel excited, but you're ready for the next thing. And what is the next thing? I think adding the third ingredient is permission. And for me, I feel like I'm telling students, telling blue in the face that they have permission to copy somebody else's project. So at this point, once you've learned maybe a new package, new functions, new suite of things to use, I suggest that you try to find somebody else's project that used some of those similar tools and just copy it. If somebody has put a blog post out there, if they've made a GitHub repository, they've put it out there. It's yours to copy. You certainly can't take credit for it and don't try to pass it off as your own work, but you can copy it. And it's totally okay to copy it, and I'm sure they would appreciate that you're using it as a learning opportunity. And so people do this in a lot of different um, areas when they're learning something new, is copying what an expert does so that you can learn how they did it. And so the point is taking a project from start to finish and being able to see how somebody who uses R code all the time structured their project, figuring out how they started, how they scoped, 
how they may be chunked up. There are code chunks into kind of, you know, uh, bite-sized tasks. Those are all things that are helpful to learn at this stage. And then you'll also learn their coding style. So if you pick somebody good, at the same time, you'll be sort of having this invisible training in how to have coding style that's readable, that's usable, that's shareable. And I love this quote from Elizabeth Gilbert. Um, your work not only doesn't have to be original, it also doesn't have to be important. So I think at this stage, it's important to remember that whether you're learning R for your job or a class or your research, um, don't put too much pressure on yourself at this point. Sort of take the pressure off. You may be studying world hunger in your real life, but you can do a silly little analysis of like Game of Thrones characters. It's fine. Like don't, don't put too much pressure on yourself to make this like the penultimate project that's going to define your career or define your next steps in R. Just figure out a project that you can look at for a few hours and not get bored with. So uh, this is another slide where I'm going to kind of skim through it and hope that you, if you find the resources useful, you go to the link. Um, these are some examples of ways to find projects to copy. Um, our weekly, again, has um, a section called R in the real world, so you can see how people use R in uh, real life circumstances. Um, and also, I recommend anything by Julia Silge. If you don't know these names, that's okay. You'll have their links to their blogs. Um, David Robinson, uh, Miles Salmon, and uh, Lucy and Nick, who, are, uh, who were previously uh, Vandy Bio students. These all have really great uh, blogs where they have uh, blog posts that walk through from start to finish the code with the output, and they're answering some question, whether it be frivolous or serious. It really doesn't matter. And another way to find a really great project is to search on Twitter, if you're on Twitter. You can search uh, by author, so this is using the um, handle Data and Me. So if you're not familiar with Data and Me on Twitter, so she posts a lot of really great blog posts and tutorials about R. Um, and she's been using the term code through, and I think that's a really great term to use for this because what we're talking about is somebody who's posted a project and is walking you through their code as they go. So code through. So for example, if I did this search, I came up with um, some sketch notes and code through for explaining predictions of machine learning models with Lime by Sharon Glander and a great code through visualizing fish encounter histories. Um, so anything that sort of strikes your fancy, you can pick one of these out, you can find all the code associated with it, and just copy it. Um, another uh, tip is if you're on GitHub already, you can uh, follow certain people and then see the repositories that they create in STAR, and this is a great way to discover new projects too. So my main advice at this stage when I'm giving you permission to copy someone else uh, is to choose who your code road model, role model is wisely. It's very important that you pick someone whose code is worth copying. So you might find that you have a really interesting project you found, but it's not quite your style. Maybe you see some code in there like attach and dollar signs to, um, uh, to denote variable names, um, and that might not be in the tidyverse style, and you want to stick in the tidyverse, for example. So Sometimes you might find a project that's just not going to meet your learning needs right now, and that's okay. I would suggest skipping it and trying to make sure that whatever you pick as your project is helping you reach your learning goals. Um, you also might run into code that as you start running it, it doesn't work. Um, and at this stage, I'm going to suggest that it is not your problem and it's not your job to fix it. It's okay. People post blog posts and they're from 2015 and the package gets updated and stuff doesn't run. Um, and I don't think that's always a productive learning exercise at this point. So try to find something relatively recently that you want to copy. Uh, I also see a lot of students picking projects that are a little bit too advanced for where they're at. So just because it's not your level now, it doesn't mean it won't be your level later. But if you're trying to copy somebody's project, maybe try picking something that seems attainable for you to do on your own later. So a lot of times I'll have students like in an introductory statistics class who will try to copy a project that involves like Tisney, for example. And I'm thinking like maybe take a few steps back, try to find something that's more in your wheelhouse, right? So the whole point of copying somebody else's project is that now you are taking somebody else's words, somebody else's R vocabulary, and you're able to figure out what R code they used and you're able to map that on to their ideas. And you're able to see how these things interact with each other. So you're able to say what they were trying to accomplish and what R code they used. And your job is really to, in your R markdown document or your R script, to use your own words and your narrative to try to say like, okay, this code chunk does this. Now I see why this went here instead of here because we had to get the data in this format in order to be able to use this model. So for example, in a project I did recently, I did this because my boss gave me a horrid R script 
that I couldn't make any sense of that did multidimensional scaling. And it took me a while to even figure out that the input for the, um, for the function was a correlation matrix. So I'm making notes to myself, figuring that out. Um, so this is how you're uh, going to think the other person who wrote the code um, looked when they made their code. So you're going to be trying for this, but it's totally okay to feel more like this. <laughs> like, you're going to be taking an R expert's code and redoing it on your own. The nice thing is they've written the code for you, but it's your job to figure out how that worked. So how do you go from copying somebody else's work, maybe sort of filling in the lines but not doing anything original, to doing something totally original? And that's where we add the fourth ingredient, which is persistence. Um, and I also love this quote by Elizabeth Gilbert. So for most of history, people just made things and they didn't make such a big freaking deal about it. So um, I suggest that at this point, you are going to embark on your own original project. But again, don't put too much pressure on yourself. Don't make it the penultimate project of your career. Just find a data set that you can work with and try to answer some questions about it. And try to do something original. So, this is a great example. Hillary Parker in 2013 did an analysis of uh, Social Security Administration baby names to look at the most poisoned name in history. Obviously, she was interested in looking at Hillary as a name. But this is a really nice analysis. And if you don't believe me that other people do this and use a simple data set to do a simple project, Julia Silge, one of her earliest blog posts, she's now a data scientist at Stack Overflow with a really great blog. Um, she did an analysis of the same data set to look at frequencies of baby names across the years to try to see, you know, if she had been born in 1953, what kind of name might she have been given? So she was, uh, the title of the post was, uh, if I had been a baby boomer, my name might have been Debbie, for example. Monica Gerber used the same data set and did an analysis to look at whether, in fact, Hillary was more poisoned than Monica. All right? <laughs> the answer is <laughs> that I believe they're both pretty bad. <laughs> um, and then more recently, Brooke Watson did an analysis where she looked at the Beyonce's per million across the different states, okay? So these are all using the exact same Social Security Administration baby name data sets, but they asked interesting questions and it's worth doing, right? So they were all able to take a simple data set, be able to ask some interesting original questions, and they had a blog post about it, and it's not such a big freaking deal. You can just do this, you don't have to find something that's extremely eloquent or extremely amazing or extremely relevant to your own research or your own goals and work. It can be a project like this. And, and I thought this was a really uh, good example of what I'm talking about. So no, no, I'm not interested in project-based learning. I'm interested in learning-based projecting. So at this point, when you're adding this persistence ingredient, I'm suggesting that you're moving into learning-based projecting. That you're taking a project, and from that project, you're figuring out what to learn next. Because it's likely that you don't have all of the materials that you need to be able to answer the questions that you want to ask. So this is really sort of more of a cycle, right? Like a recursive thing where you're constantly cycling between using these ingredients. And once you get into this persistence phase, and I think this is where most advanced R users live, you're constantly having to figure out, oh, now I need to learn this new package. Okay, I've got to go back, figure out what materials to use, gather my courage. I've got to do this enchantment thing where I start figuring out how it works with their package vignette. Then I've got to start figuring out how that worked for other people, maybe in their own data set. And then I'm going to try to apply that to my own data set. Um, so I did this recently. Um, I was trying to create, or I was trying to analyze data from the Great British Bake Off, and I really wanted to use this data. Um, and I found that there was no data available, no data sets. So I found that the data was all actually available in Wikipedia tables that I needed to scrape. But being a psychologist who does uh, research on kids with autism, this was not in my wheelhouse. So I figured out that I needed to learn RVEST to scrape the web pages. Um, so I learned how to do that. I was able to scrape one table. But then what happens is I have a new problem. I figured out that I needed to scrape the same table for all eight series. And I knew I didn't want to just do that individually for all eight, so I figured out how to learn, or I had a funnily example for why I needed to learn PER, because I knew I needed to learn it, but I hadn't quite taken the steps to do it yet. So after learning both of those new packages, I was able to write a very simple function that allowed me to get the data that I wanted from the Great British Bake Off, and I was able to move on with my actual work that I wanted to do with that. Um, and then at the point where I got it, out of these two packages, I was working with a data frame that I knew how to work with. I, had, I went back to my wheelhouse of all my data wrangling tools that are already um, sort of in my toolbox, and I was able to kind of get back to my enchantment place pretty quickly. So some really great advice, I think, um, from Andrew McDonald at this stage is, my new thing is ending every R Markdown document with a list of links to the forums, stack overflow questions, blogs, GitHub repositories that I use to solve the problem. 
I think this is really great advice. I do this all the time. This is another one of those dump slides where I'm going to say if you think the resources are useful. Um, I made a list of all the resources that I used for PER, and uh, this was really helpful for me to be able to go back to and retrace my steps. So the whole point of this is that we're going from finally your own ideas to your own words to your own R code. Um, at this stage, though, uh, you aren't doing it wrong if no one knows what you're doing. Uh, and that's good for a little bit. That kind of feels nice. But if you're not in a class where you have a professor and a TA looking at your code, you need to get someone else to look at your code. You need to have somebody else's eyes on it. So at that point, you need to add your fifth ingredient, which is trust. So I thought this was a great uh, tweet. I figured out how to do a little thing in R stats without Googling it. GIF is appropriate because R still feels like magic sometimes. So at this point, one version of trust is just trusting your own independent problem-solving skills. If you figured out how to use all the ingredients before and you're able to kind of use the help docs, figure out how to demystify them, you might be able to figure things out without going to Stack Overflow and copying and pasting somebody else's answer and just putting it into your pipeline and not worrying about how it worked. And not to make everyone feel bad, but these were fifth graders who learned how to use R. Um, and this is a really great example of just putting their trust out there, getting some feedback on what they did, and sharing their experience. So some ways to build up your trust, I think creating a GitHub repository um, or GitHub account and putting your stuff in a repository is really helpful. Um, you can make your own website. I'm biased, but I suggest the blog down package. And uh, I suggest that you also try to find a friend. But just make sure somebody else looks at your code. So you can partner up with someone in your team, lab, or company. You can find a coding partner at a local R meetup or R ladies group. Um, or if you're on Twitter, you can ask the R stats Twitterverse. So returning back to Katie Jolly, uh, for anyone who's interested, I've set up a GitHub repository for an upgraded version of my list. It'll be here. Feel free to suggest other resources. And I think this is a great way for her to turn around her 40-page Google Doc and make it something that's useful for other learners, but also probably more useful for her, too. Uh, Edwin Thion also had a blog post about four reasons why I think it's a good idea to blog about something you've learned. So you could also do that to kind of build up your trust in the R community. I did this. I wrote a blog post purely for myself on using the blog down package because I found it really hard to do. Um, Amber Thomas also did this, and I used her blog post extensively as well. <laughs> and the author of the blog down package actually contacted both of us. We were added as authors on the book, and we were able to kind of take our experiences and translate them to be able to help, hopefully, other users as well learn blog down. And I'm not saying this uh, always happens if you have a blog post. I realize this is sort of a Cinderella story and a total one-off and is never going to happen to me again. But I think what it shows is that the R stats community is really welcoming of new beginners and new learners and is really interested in supporting learning. So where are we? Um, I'm hoping what I've uh, told you about today maybe rings true for advanced users. Maybe you're thinking that I actually do use all these ingredients. I just don't talk about them like this. Um, and maybe for new users and advanced users, you've realized that maybe more of your formal learning process is that you figure out that you want to learn X. And you don't know X, but you know that you can figure it out. So building up these ingredients, I've sort of presented them in a linear way. But really, they're sort of more of a circular path. And you're kind of constantly going back and forth between building up your you know, courage, enchantment, permission, persistence, and trust, and circling back along these. So persistence was coming up with an original project. But sometimes, in order to do that project, you have to learn something new. So you have to be able to go back. Um, sometimes once you put your trust out there, somebody might tell you, like, hey, you should have used this packet. That one was deprecated and not updated. And so you have to go back to start over and figure out how to learn that. So I maintain that learning uh, should not feel like this, where you're just constantly not quite sure exactly where you came from or where you're going, and uh, that you're a little bit more organized about how it feels. Um, but this is how I think a lot of new learners feel. It just feels totally overwhelming. Um, I think learning should feel more like this, where you're sort of enjoying yourself, you're happy, and you're enjoying the experience for what it is. And I think that's what makes R really unique. So thank you for your time and attention. And I think I ran a little bit over, but. <laughs> We can take one question. <laughs> one. <laughs> Pressure. I'll be around the rest of the conference, so please come introduce yourself and come chat with me. So she has to run right now because she's receiving an award for being an amazing teacher. <laughs> <laughs>